I want to tee up our next panel by talking about the issue we're going to discuss. COVID has been a stress test for this nation's ability to reach 100% of our students, and we're failing. Today, millions of students sit on the wrong side of the digital divide, either because they live in a community without high-speed internet or because their family can't afford it. They can't easily participate in remote learning. This is an injustice that we need to address, and now. Today's internet is essential to learning, and even when COVID is behind us, we will still need to address the digital divide. Right now, roughly 9 million K-12 students and 400,000 public school teachers lack reliable internet access required for learning. We're creating a system of digital haves and have-nots in the classroom. What America needs is a digital infrastructure plan suited to our economy, akin to President Dwight Eisenhower's 1956 Interstate Highway Act, a sweeping plan to create and support technology-neutral broadband access, such as mobile and fixed wireless, cable, fiber, and satellite, with a special focus on rural and underserved communities. To help us learn about what might be possible, either at the federal or state level, and with the partnership of the private sector, please welcome two friends who really understand this issue. Jonathan Adelstein is the president and CEO of Wireless Infrastructure Association, an industry group that focuses on building out wireless broadband facilities. Jonathan is also a former member of the FCC and later served as the administrator of the Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service, where he oversaw the department's $60 billion portfolio of rural electric, water, and telecommunications loans. Larry Irving is the former Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information and Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and is currently the President and CEO of the Irving Group. 25 years ago, he coined the term Digital Divide. Also, please welcome our moderator, Stephanie Sanford. Stephanie is the Chief of Global Policy and External Relations for the College Board. She leads the College Board advocacy initiatives with policymakers, public and private institutions, and organizations to advance educational access and opportunity for all students. I can't think of a panel better suited to focus on this issue. I hope you enjoy the conversation. So thank you, Governor Bush, for setting the stage so well. And, uh, and welcome to our audience and panelists. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce, to introduce an addition to our discussion. Uh, Evan Marwell is a serial entrepreneur who has founded successful business, businesses in tech and finance, and he's now CEO of the Education Superhighway, which partners with policymakers and philanthropy to upgrade school internet connections across the country. Thanks for being with us, Evan. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. This discussion of the digital divide has been going on for decades. Everyone agrees we have to fix it, but it's not clear what to do and how to do it. And the pandemic has made solving it even more urgent than ever before. In that spirit, urgency and a focus on what and how, we're gonna talk about specifics today in this panel. Concrete recommendations on how to best leverage today's challenges, the opportunity of stimulus funds and an urgent consensus to make sustainable progress on this critical issue. To do that, we're gonna structure our discussion in two segments what to do with one-time money, sort of stimulus or, release or relief funds, CARES Act money, to address the physical infrastructure, to leverage both urgency and relief funds. And then we're gonna spend the second half talking about the longer term investments to maintain both physical and human infrastructure to close the digital divide for the long haul. So that's our setup. So to get us started, I'd, I'd like to start, Larry, I'd like to start with you. You named this phenomenon, the digital divide, over 20 years ago, and you have been an advocate for equitable access ever since. I'd love to hear some of your innovative recommendations to solve this problem now, not five years from now, but how do we help students during this academic year? Thank you, Stephanie, and it's good to join you and Governor Bush um, at this important conversation. You know, I had the, um, the great good fortune of serving on two presidential transition teams. So I have a sense of what can be done during a presidential transition and, and the kind of one-time money that you're talking about, how you can act with a sense of urgency. The first time I um, was involved with the transition was pre-internet. It was 1992-93, and we really did focus on just getting the internet up, getting people to understand what it was and talking to schools and hospitals, libraries, about why they were so essential to um, driving it out. And the second time was um, going into the, uh, the Obama years, where I helped develop the BTOP program. So I've been there twice. 
Um, and the BTOP program, I think, is a, is a good example of what we can do. But even more important than the uh, broadband telecommunications options program or the BTOP program was what we did with uh, the converter boxes as we moved from digital, from um, analog to digital television. What we did then, we did a one-time program where we gave vouchers to everybody in the country to ensure that they had, um, were able to, if they couldn't afford it, they could move from analog to digital. And I see this as, this problem right now is very similar. I think we need to change the Lifeline program, uh, which gives people a uh, stipend uh, to it currently of about roughly $10. And with that, they can buy either um, broadband service or cellular service or at home service, but only one of those. I think we need to increase that price, uh, that, that voucher now significantly to make sure that all of the families that are on the wrong side of digital divide are able to afford um, broadband to their home, whether it's wired or wireless. And I also think we need to have a one-time subsidy for families that don't have laptops or computers. You know, there's a term that's being used in Europe and Australia that I think we need to focus a little bit more in the United States. We're not just talking about digital divide, we're talking about digital poverty. And that's what's the problem right now. We have 40% of um, black and brown workers have lost one source of income. And we're seeing literally tens of thousands of, city, of, of students just in New York City alone, my hometown, who don't have access to a laptop. So what I would do if I were benevolent despot, if, if I got called by the administration to come back in for this transition, I would, I would increase the um, Lifeline program from the existing $10 to $25 to $50. I would ensure that every student that needed a laptop or other computing device had a voucher that allowed his or her parent to go into a school or to a store and get a, a computing device to help that child. And there's one other thing I would do, and Evan and I will sure we'll have some uh, conversations around this. I would make sure that every school and library um, that's presently connected to the internet was mapped so that we had an understanding where they all were. Because we've spent billions of taxpayer dollars to connect schools and libraries, I would also look at the efficacy of putting an antenna on top of every one of those schools, every one of those libraries, and see if we couldn't create community networks that would allow people to have access to those networks for free. There is an opportunity. We've already spent that money. We're seeing it happen in places uh, in Utah, in California, where people are using existing investment to give people access to neighborhood um, quality broadband using wireless services. I've talked longer than I intended to, so with that, I'll stop. No, that's great, Larry. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, so Jonathan, I'd like to go to you, um, to you next. Um, rural access has been um, has been a particularly, particularly difficult problem, a complicated issue. And we're hearing uh, uh, about students in rural areas who struggle to stay online or in school um, and rural access to telemedicine. Um, what would be, um, what, what are your recommendations about, uh, about what we can do about the, the particular rural problem? It really is a, a big issue for the country. And of course, we've seen in the pandemic how important connectivity is. And if there's any part of the country that's really not fully connected, it's rural America. There are issues with uh, affordability, as, as Larry pointed out, in, in other parts of the country, but in rural areas, sometimes it's an access issue. We just don't have the level of connectivity we need. I think what we've seen is that the value of the network is so tremendous to society. But what we sometimes forget in basic economic terms is those who are investing in the networks, my members at WIA that uh, you've heard of, the big names like at t Verizon, and T-Mobile, uh, but all the companies that do the work for them, they need to have the economic incentive to do it. And the way the economics work is, is rural areas do get a lot of investment, but is it enough given the additional expense? And so the government set up programs like the Universal Service Fund, uh, which has really been tremendously important. Um, and the Rural Utility Service, which I used to run in the previous administration, uh, we had enormous, uh, thanks to Larry, uh, stimulus funds as well, along with the BTOP program, to build out funds to those rural areas. And we made huge progress, but there's so far to go because basically there's this market failure where the level of investment in rural areas is not optimized because the benefits to society are greater than the benefits to the companies that are actually making the investment, if that makes sense. So that the level of investment would, is, this is one of those areas where I think Republicans and Democrats agree. And it's not that many issues where we have that. There's bipartisan support for getting some, this out to rural areas and it has to be subsidized because otherwise you won't get um, all these areas connected. Now, there's, you have to make the distinction between the very hardest to reach areas that just don't justify the investment. Because there's trade-offs. You know, Larry pointed out some of the issues with, um, with uh, affordability and, and lifeline. The government can't pay for, for everything. But we, we've got to realize that there's got to be a greater investment 
in, in rural and, and there is. So if there is a legislation, I think on infrastructure, there's no question that there's gonna be a major uh, section on, um, on broadband infrastructure, something Republicans and Democrats agree on. So just a question of whether there's going to be a vehicle, can we get bipartisan support for a bill? And if we do, this will be one of the driving forces. So thanks, Jonathan. Evan, uh, so uh, Larry teed up that you all, and we actually in our conversations that I've had with each of you prior to this, I know that they, you have uh, uh, some different views um, and we welcome that on uh, on this panel. I think that the, uh, the, the problems that are complicated and tough to solve, I think they they, uh, they benefit from, uh, from a, a, a robust exchange of views. So um, one, we've said that uh, sort of implications is that 100% access um, isn't feasible in, in some cases because of the expense of that last mile to rural, um, or some in some places people just don't want it or see its value. Uh, talk a little bit um, about uh, so the distinction between sort of access and adoption, and particularly the trade offs of speed and last mile. So, first of all, I think you know, all three of us probably agree more than we disagree on this panel that uh, you know, first of all we all agree on the objective. We, we need to get as many Americans online as fast as we can, because in today's day and age, if you're not online, you can't get good work, you can't get good education, you can't get health care, you can't get access to government services, and the list goes on and on. And I think we all want that. I think Jonathan's right. We need a big investment to bring internet infrastructure out to rural America. You know, when we were working on connecting the schools and, and we've now connected over 99% of the schools in America to high-speed broadband, we heard the exact same things. Oh, they're too far away. Oh, it's gonna cost too much to get there. Well, actually it wasn't. And, and I completely agree with Larry that now that we have that infrastructure out to those schools, we need to leverage that. We, we, we need to not say, okay, now let's build it all over again. You know, schools are close to where the people are and we need, we need to leverage that capacity that we've already built the fiber optic connections to get there. I also agree with Larry that though, that, you know, actually the bigger problem we have with getting people online is affordability. If you look at the data, there's about 30 million households in the US that don't have connectivity. Somewhere around 12 million or so of those don't have it because they don't have any infrastructure available to them. That means 18 million don't have it because they can't afford it. And we need to address that issue of affordability if we wanna get Americans online. And it means we can make a tremendous amount of progress very quickly if we focus on subsidizing internet for those individuals. Now, the place that Larry and I disagree is, you know, he, he wants to expand the Lifeline program. Look, the federal government needs to expand its funding of internet access for people who can't afford it, just like it has to expand its funding of infrastructure builds. But I think that what we really need to do is switch how we think about procurement of internet for individuals that can't afford it and don't have it. You know, we've seen that the Lifeline program only has 25% of the eligible people actually utilizing the program. Adoption is a big problem, but there's a solution to that. And the solution is to take the responsibility for buying internet out of the hands of every family. Make it so that they don't have to go run the gauntlet of all the challenges they face in trying to sign up for internet service, figuring out which services are available, figuring out if they qualify, figuring out how to actually get through the complex signup processes, which can be particularly hard for, for families that have that English is not their first language. And, and figuring out how to get over the, the credit issues and the debt problems that they may have that prevent them. What we're seeing happen today in solving the home broadband problem for students is that states and school districts and cities are stepping in to be the buyers of internet access. They're aggregating procurement and they're buying in bulk. And that means we're getting the best prices and we're getting procurement done quickly so that we can then focus on getting families connected. So I agree with Jonathan and Larry on, on the problems we have to solve. I think there's a little bit of a tweak in terms of how I'd go about the procurement process for this. So, uh, so Governor Bush, I'd like to, to turn with you. We've got sort of three different uh, sort of inputs about the uh, about the, the need for a big infrastructure push. And you you wrote a terrific article and, and kicked us off in this panel 
um, by hearkening back to the interstate highway, the interstate highway project. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and then its implications, um, particularly in, in light of the, the sort of contemporary complexities that our other panelists just outlined? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I would first say that uh, we've been talking, gosh, for the last 10 years about infrastructure weeks. Like every week's an infrastructure week and nothing happens. And now I think it's time to look at this as a long-term investment, just as Dwight Eisenhower did when he was assigned the task of identifying the logistical challenge of the Department of Defense in this big sprawling country of being able to get equipment across the country. And he was appalled by the fact that it was near impossible to do it. We were not connected as a nation. And I guess that spark, frustration or whatever it was, as we reported back to the uh, many layers of bureaucracy inside the Department of Defense, gave him the opportunity when he was president to have a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. And that was to, to connect our country. And the economic benefits of that one-time investment yielded returns that were enormous. This, this isn't a one-time spending thing. This is, this is necessary for all sorts of other investment to take place. As we roll out 5G, the, the communities that have access to high-speed broadband will see economic activities that will far exceed what they, even, what they can imagine. We'll, we'll deal with the equity issues of, the, of rural America versus the big teeming urban areas that, that um, comprise most of the GDP in this country. Um, if, we want, if we're serious about economic justice and economic equity, then we need to create a digital footprint that allows everybody to access it. Evan brought up the healthcare issues. Um, we, every healthcare entity went online. And if you can't access that, you're, gonna make, you're not gonna be making healthy lifestyle decisions to prevent illness. And certainly in the subject that we are passionate about, Stephanie, on education, we have failed miserably dealing with the equity issue and the learning losses that have taken place in last semester and this semester and perhaps going forward even more, the lack of accountability is tragic. You can't overcome the, the lack of uh, understanding of math achievement and being able to read at a young age. And so I think this is the time for presidential leadership, congressional leadership. What I'm amazed at is there is huge support in philanthropy, in the business community, local governments, state governments, and hopefully Washington uh, once we get beyond the, you know, the turmoil of the, of the next few weeks, that there's a broad consensus to act. And my suggestion is that we seize the moment because, gosh, even when we agree, it seems like it's really hard for our country to move forward. Now we have to, I think, cast that aside and, and create a very creative long range strategy to make sure that we deal with this issue. Larry, I know that you, you have been working on this a while and you and Evan both have talked about sort of coalitions um, in support of this uh, federal action. Can you talk a little bit about that? I wanna focus uh, a little bit more on sort of the, 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 the infrastructure decisions that could be made in, in, this big, so in this big sort of pandemic moment at a time of, of transition to a new administration. And as Governor Bush said, a real consensus of, of that this is a time to, to make these kinds of investments in what I would call sort of the technological infrastructure. I'd like to get real specific there in what you think would be the components of that. And then I'd like to turn to, uh, to where Governor Bush gestured and that's some of the more, some of the more human components um, around sort of around education and, and uh, healthcare and training. So would you like to uh, sort of your, Larry? Absolutely. I'd like to associate myself with the remarks from the gentleman from Florida. Um, the governor laid out a, a plan that I, I just love. And, and Jonathan and I um, actually spent a lot of time back in the 90s um, um, kind of working on what in the old days wasn't red states versus um, blue states. It was square states versus um, the coastal states. And the square states, what we call the states in the middle of the country. And, and Governor, the, the compromises and Stephanie, the compromise I think we can reach are we do need to spend 20, $30 billion connecting rural America. We need to build out the infrastructure. That's going to happen. I think that whether you're um, a Republican in the Senate or a Democrat in the House, there is a strong appetite for putting significant money into those last miles in, in rural America. That is, I'm almost certain it's gonna happen. What's, what, what's happened over the last year, that's been, uh, last few years that's been unfortunate, is rural uh, the, the digital divide has been defined as almost a rural issue. And we've talked about the fact that affordability is at least as important. And so what I think you're gonna see, Stephanie, is rural interests and urban interests coalescing for the, for the good of the nation. 
that we don't have the, um, the luxury of engaging in kind of partisan politics or geography politics. We've got to get every kid connected. You cannot have a nation where eight, nine, 10 year olds to the governor's point are losing a year of education simply because the schools are closed and their families can't afford um, a con connection or they can't get a connection to that child's home. We cannot have a nation where young students are sitting outside of Taco Bell uh, trying to get educated using Wi-Fi. Those scenarios should, should trouble all of us. And I think Congress has finally focused on that. I, I, my sense is, and I've talked to some folks in a transition, I've talked to some folks on both sides of the Hill. Um, my sense is there will be a robust um, expenditure toward broadband, whether it's 70 billion or 80 billion, there will be significant dollars. What's gonna be included in that is difficult to tell, but I would suggest that it will include um, requirement for true broadband mapping. So we have a sense, having a ready fire aim philosophy of building broadband before you know where broadband exists makes no sense. So mapping will be included. There will be some significant dollars, well in excess of 10 billion, probably closer to 20 or 25 for rural connectivity. There will be some money for a re rethinking of Lifeline and there will be some money in there for rethinking of the E-rate program. That's gonna be the immediate money. And I know we're gonna talk later about the, um, uh, how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? But there's one other thing that I'm hopeful that I've been trying to push people to think about. We don't have a sense of what's happening with healthcare. We don't have a sense of what's happening with education. And I hope there'll be some analysis of what's actually happening, who's using it, how are they using it? And before we start spending more money, have a sense of a baseline of where we are today. Um, I haven't heard as much conversation about that as I think is important. So thanks, Larry. Evan, um, I'd like to go to you about this question of the trade-off between um, speed of broadband and speed of ensuring access. What's the trade-off there in your view? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, do we need to up the standard of what is broadband in America today, right? And there's a lot of people out there who think that, you know, the current FCC standard of uh, 25 megabits down and three megabits up is not sufficient. Um, I, I think I, and, and Larry is one of them. <laughs> um, I think I take a different point of view, which is rather than focusing on upping speeds and um, getting more infrastructure to places where we already have infrastructure, which I think we will need to do over time, the, the urgency of the moment is getting people connected. And no matter what kind of infrastructure is available to them, the first priority for our nation needs to be to get people online to whatever is available to them. And if there's nothing available to them, then we need to get with building as fast as we can to get those folks connected as well. Um, but, you know, whether it's 25-3, it's 25-25, it's 55, it's 100-100, you know, a 25-3 connection can do a lot today. You can do Zoom calls today. You can access telemedicine today. You can, you can access government services. You can go to school over a 25-3. Now, if you have five people in your household all trying to do it at the same time, maybe that's not going to work. But I think rather than prioritizing higher speeds, we should be prioritizing higher adoption of what connectivity is available today. So Larry, I'm gonna give you a chance to weigh in here. I mean, it seems like a classic uh, innovator's dilemma, right? You think about um, Clay Christensen talking about, you know, sort of um, uh, the, the, the sort of deck supercomputers being overtaken by PCs or, you know, the, the emergence of transistor radios. Do you buy that argument here? That, you know, that, that, that there's a trade-off between between great and better than nothing. Not in urban. Um, you know, mm -hmm. when when I when I think about, I, I've traveled. I hit every fifty, every one of the fifty states when I was an assistant secretary, and I've traveled almost as many states since I left government. I think there's a huge difference between going to cut and shoot Texas or to um, a Native American reservation or to um, uh, places in North Dakota that don't have any connectivity than there is if you're talking about New York or Chicago or or Jacksonville. Um, I want to get the folks that, that um, Jonathan represents something, because some of them have nothing. Um, but to tell a kid in, I live in Washington, D.C., I'm, I'm a block from a school. I've got kids down the, uh, on my block where I live. I'm, I'm talking about a gig network. So teachers can do all kinds of things. And there are kids on a 25-3, and then there are other kids with zero. It makes no sense to me to tell the, the teacher that, 
We're going to put all of your kids have to deal with the 25-3 in Washington, D.C. when gig technology is available. I'm not saying we just have a gig, but certainly we can do better in urban areas in 25-3. And the, and the cost, you know, of giving a kid 100 versus 25 megs is incremental. It doesn't cost that much. So we, 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 I, I want first to get every one of Jonathan's kids connected to something. And then the second thing I want to do is make sure that the kids in urban areas have, are able, and the teachers are able to do, and, 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 and sick families are able to do what they can with a really robust as opposed to a just good enough broadband connectivity. And, and Evan, I hope you won't mind if I use the analogy I had when we had a private conversation. I grew up in the projects and my family got lucky and moved out of the projects. Um, and we had this kind of top down government enforced food. And I still remember the jars, uh, I mean, these cans of what we call welfare peanut butter. Now I'm blessed that my family never had to have welfare peanut butter, but if you ever had it, we had to take the top of this big can and then there's a big glob of oil on top of it and you had to stir the oil. That was what some families in my community ate. And they, nobody wanted to eat that stuff. To my, to my mind, what Evan is offering with regard to 25.3 is welfare broadband and no one's gonna want that either. And so we have to find ways to make it palatable and enjoyable and accessible and affordable and if you can go down and get Skippy or you get this big glob of can of oily stuff, what do you think people are going to really want? And folks know Skippy exists. And so that's what my, my problem with some of Evan's um, um, su suggestions. So, Jonathan, I want to bring you in. This question, um, uh, this sort of question of, of speed of access versus um, versus access in general. I, you've done a lot of work in, in rural areas. Um, how would you square this circle or advise on the infrastructure spend? Well, the, you know, the margin of value of additional broadband is diminished as it gets higher speed. I mean, getting somebody just basic access, you know, if, if it's a, like if it's a, your first million dollars is worth a lot more to you than your second and your 20th and your 30th. Same thing with broadband. Your first 25 megabits are your most valuable. We need to be technologically neutral. This is the important fact. We need to have, um, you know, you're not going to put second rate uh, equipment in for whatever federal dollars are used. When we did it, all the money back in 2010 was for fiber. We didn't put any copper in, even though some networks were still copper. We weren't paying for it because it didn't make sense. Um, and, you know, we tried to prioritize the higher bandwidth. That was the factor we looked at if somebody's willing to deliver more when we were making awards for, for our grants and our, our loans, we would reward that. But if somebody would get it out there efficiently, you know, we had our minimums and, and 25.3 is a pretty good place to start. Uh, you know, we don't care if it's wireless, wireline, and, and I represent the wireless industry now, and I think 5G pretty quickly and cheaply can get a lot of bandwidth out to a lot of people. Rather than having to put fiber to every home, you got to get fiber to the tower, and then you could cover a lot of territory. And if you do that, you know, as it gets further out, the you know the bandwidth gets a little bit lower, but they're going to be able to do most of the work they need to do. I mean, yeah, you probably if you're distant from a 600 megahertz connection out in the you know far distant area you're not going to have five families able to do HDTV at the same time, but can the person who most needs it get through on a zoom call and watch their class or can they uh, do a job interview when they need to? Yes. So you, you don't want to, I think gold plate, as we used to call it uh, federal funding, you need to get as much out to as many people as you can, uh, but set basic standards and reward those who give more bandwidth. So I, 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 uh, I think there's been a super uh, concrete discussion about what, um, about what one-time money stimulus taking care or uh, addressing the question of technological access, of, of taking Governor Bush's challenge and sort of um, uh, hearkening back to um, the Eisenhower infrastructure and what the ROI would be more broadly and what would that take with one-time money. I wanna, I wanna turn to, uh, and you've all been sort of gesturing to it now, right? The, um, it's not just enough to, to lay fiber or to create subsidies or to build towers. Um, there's a human, there's a very much a human, uh, a human component to this. Um, we found that out um, uh, at the college board when we moved our uh, AP exams online in the spring. We knew that there was a digital divide, but we really didn't know what its scope would be. And so we you know, we put out a form and we set up a, a hundred volunteers on customer service to take calls. And we thought that we would be uh, dealing with questions of devices and connectivity. And we certainly did, but the 28,000 folks that, 28,000 students and teachers that called us, um, 
sometimes they needed tech support help or they didn't know how to get a device from their district. They needed a, um, a sort of human connection. And so I think, you know, sometimes we, when particularly when we talk about um, questions of, of infrastructure or federal spending, um, we sort of blow past that, um, the, the, the sort of human part. So Jonathan, I'd like to go back to you. We had an interesting conversation about the, the notion of workforce. We talked here in, our, in, in the potential infrastructure spend of 20 or 30 billion or 70 billion. Um, uh, what's the workforce? Is the workforce there to be able to, to implement that and to build it? It's not. We have a workforce shortage right now uh, for people that really know how to build these. You think, well, there's plenty of workers out there with the unemployment levels we have today, but they don't know how to build 5G networks. This is the most complex generation of wireless yet. And uh, this is an opportunity, a challenge. I mean, the challenge is you're going to put 20, 30, 40 billion dollars, as Larry's talking about, into uh, broadband in rural areas and other parts of the country. And we already have a shortage of workforce to do what the private investment is doing today. You're going to put more demand on the labor force that's already short supply. So if Congress doesn't provide some funding for training as a part of that, we'll be missing an opportunity. And I think they, I think they will. There's bipartisan support for workforce development. We can reskill people. We can help to diversify our workforce. This is an opportunity to bring in uh, veterans and minorities and women into the industry. Uh, this is an opportunity to uh, take people that are underemployed or unemployed and bring them into an industry wireless that's going to continue to grow for the foreseeable future. We've had enormous success in that recently. The Department of Labor has stepped up and uh, provided uh, funding for apprenticeships. And apprenticeships are really the key here. I mean, it, our industry is perfect for apprenticeships. So we've started an apprenticeship program through my organization, WI, called, called TIRAP, that has signed up 30 employers, 2,000 apprentices, uh, and we're ready to, to do a lot more, but we need help from state level policymakers. I would say to those on the call that you're, you're looking for where you're going to, you know, set up your budget for next year. Uh, in addition to supporting, you know, wireless infrastructure, they need to support career and technical education that aligns with the national standards that we've set out for the industry and supporting apprenticeships in, in, in their states for 5G. When you're looking at your workforce needs, when you're looking at where can we set up programs in community colleges, our industry is ready to work with states, work with their educational systems to establish uh, vocational educational programs that you can earn um, as you learn in apprenticeship and the you know benefits for the, the, the workforce will be tremendous. But if we don't have people in rural areas to build the networks, you're not gonna get all those other benefits of economic development that Governor Bush talked about and healthcare and education. Uh, so you know we need to have the, the right people to build the network so that all the other jobs that come with wireless can, can grow as well. Do you have a sense of what the scale of that is? I mean, are we, is this th thousands, ten thousands? And, and is this a, a, a almost a sort of a, a Marshall plan almost for, for rural economic development? Well, you know, it's, it's probably in the range of 50,000 apprenticeable positions, a hundred thousand jobs, which in the context of our economy is not Marshall uh, level of, of job needs. It's a specialized crew, but here's the key point. There have been numerous studies that show that when 5G is built, it'll create 4.6 million jobs in virtually every sector of the economy. So you're gonna have people uh, you know, that, are, that are working in high tech. They could be in rural areas, they'll be able to do that. You got the Facebooks and the Googles of the world to make a fortune, but the next one will be created on 5G. Again, that's not benefits you're gonna to accrue to the industries that are making the investments, but it's going to accrue to the economy. So these 50,000, 100,000 jobs that we need are going to be able to build networks that will create millions of jobs in every sector of the economy and enable rural parts of the country to participate fully in that economic growth. Fascinating, Jonathan. Um, uh, Governor, would like to go to you. You, you, uh, you, you talked a little bit about um, sort of what kind of training um, teachers would need, students, parents. I mean, as we think about building... Um, the, uh, the human capital, what, what sort of uh, training do we need to, to, to see the education benefits of now this, uh, uh, this, this great infrastructure investment well, for the online uh, learning model? Yeah, so I, before I try to answer that question, I, I think it's also important to know that um, there's been a lot of focus on DC. I think whatever happens, it ought to be bottom up. Um, mm -hmm. The money should be, there should be clear accountability and transparency about how the money can be spent. 
but to use a Maoist term in an American language, let a thousand flowers bloom. Every community is different. The strategies could be different. This should be a renaissance of really solid policy making uh, with this one-time money. It can make a huge difference. Um, so education is a place where training is really going to be essential. We've seen, first of all, there's 300,000 teachers, according to uh, Boston Consulting Group, that don't have access to high-speed internet. So how are they going to teach if they if they're they're stuck in their homes. I mean, this, this is a, the problem is not just for our children, it's also for uh, teachers. And they're not trained to deal with the flipped classroom situation. Um, the, the studies that I've seen, and I agree that there should be more studying of this during these, this, this year of, of quarantine to get a better sense of what the strategies need to be going forward. This is a huge opportunity if we train our teachers and train school districts to be able to go online, you could, you could imagine a renaissance in learning where you, know, you could have homework in the classroom and classroom in the home uh, where teachers could, could do the work that they're really good at, which is to remediate when there's a, a concept that a student is struggling with. You could see an acceleration of learning, particularly with lower income kids that where the achievement gap is the greatest. So um, I hope that, and, and this is a place um, what Jonathan's commitment to training, I think, is absolutely right on. I think there's a real consensus about digital infrastructure being important, bipartisan consensus, rural urban consensus, which is unique. We ought to grab, seize the moment when, when there is consensus in this hyper political world we're in. And I think there's also a consensus about uh, workforce training, that we need to move to a 21st century workforce training. Governors, Republicans, and Democrats alike are embracing these ideas. If you look at where the CARES money is going uh, for their, their, their pot of dough, um, they're, they're doing a lot of really creative things in this area. So I think there's also a broad consensus out in the states, at least, about moving more towards workforce training that gives people credentials, that give them jobs, rather than filling a spot, training someone for a job that will never exist again. No, that, absolutely fascinating. Um, so, Larry, are there um, uh, to build on what the governor just said? Do you have, are there particular states or countries that you think are doing a, a great job? And we should look to them right now. It's hard to know. Um, the reality is, no one's no one's capturing the information. Again, I want to associate myself with the governor's remarks um, first, with regard to making sure the states and the cities have the money. Um, these problems are going to be solved closest to the levels of the problem. I'm, you know, even though I was a federal employee most of my life. Um, when we started doing these internet, when we first started rolling out schools and libraries and hospitals, we learned so much more from what was happening in local communities that what was happening in Tennessee was maybe smarter than what was happening in Washington, D.C., almost always was. And so getting that. But, but the other point that I, I really think is important, you know, I, I'm a, a trustee at my, my alma mater, my undergraduate alma mater, and I asked a question just on Friday. Are we learning things about education that we didn't know before as most of the learning at, at my alma Northwestern went online? And the deans of every school said, absolutely, we're learning a lot. And I'm like, well, are we talking to MIT? Are we talking to Harvard? Are we talking to um, 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 uh, Flagler Community College? Because every one of these schools simultaneously are undergoing a revolution in education. They're rethinking it. We're seeing flipped classrooms where teachers are saying they're now taping their lectures and letting students um, uh, and using their uh, online hours for smaller class size or one-on-one -on -one or, or group conversations. We need to capture that and we need to measure that and see what's happening with it. I completely agree. Education in 2022, 23 is not going to look anything like education looked in 2018 and 2017. But we can, we can make it better, stronger, and, um, and improve it for every kid in this country if we start capturing those lessons, start talking to each other, and take the lessons learned and best practices um, and coordinating them in some kind of a fashion. And again, what's going to happen at a Hispanic serving institution may be different what happened at City University of New York. But they still are learning things that we need to um, capture. One of the pieces that I do want to add, um, Jonathan talked about the importance of training folks um, in rural America. And I agree completely, and we need to do that. But if you take large cities like New York City, 40% of small businesses in New York City don't have access right now to a gig network. How are you going to succeed in any city if you, don't, if you don't have access to and understand? We also need to train folks to help small business people um, emerging businesses in our urban areas, how to uh, learn how to use some of these technologies. I have a U brick I fix in my neighborhood um, where I live in Washington, D.C. There isn't one where I grew up in South Jamaica, New York. And so there are opportunities for folks who, who are getting new to this internet revolution to train kids in those communities to be um, high tech um, employees. 
And we need to think about that too. We can put millions of kids at work with just a little bit of smart investment across this country, both in rural and urban America, helping to build these networks and help people understand it. If you go to a, 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 um, a low-income housing project anywhere in this country, they're underserved by broadband. And the folks who live in those communities don't know how to use that technology. We need folks in those communities who people in those communities trust to help them learn how to use and leverage these uh, technologies. This isn't nuclear science. Uh, this isn't rocket, um, you know, rocket science. There are, there are tangible things we can and should be doing that are relatively small investments that will pay off hugely as we upskill, reskill, and rethink what employment looks like in a, um, a broadband era. Can I just uh, jump in there, Yola? I want to make sure it's clear that I'm not saying that these jobs are just in rural America. The beauty of wireless jobs is they're distributed everywhere. We have wireless networks in every square corner of the country, and we have job shortages everywhere. I think what policymakers need to focus on, you talked a bit about college, but we need to access you know, what's going on at the very local level um, on career pathways across K-12 education, community colleges, you know, at a lower level, I think the emphasis has often been on a college degree, but there needs to be equal support for industry recognized certificates at, um, you know, high growth industries like ours at community colleges, at uh, technical schools. And we need to get kids in high school, um, you know, connected to industries that are growing like ours. I mean, I'm kind of pushing it because I've got a crisis in our industry where we need to get more bodies in wireless right now, but you're finding out that that we aren't getting people into that industry because there aren't the right pathways created. And, and youth apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship programs that states can focus on, I mean, they certainly need to include broadband and 5G in there, but there are other high growth industries that can that can happen at that level too, in, in cities, in HBCUs, in, uh, you know, across the country, in urban and, and rural areas alike. I mean, Jonathan, very quickly, 60 to 70 percent of adult Americans today don't have a four-year college degree. And in communities like mine, that number is even lower. We need to put every American that wants to work and is willing to work and has the capacity to work at to work. And we can do that in your industry and, and, and other um, broadband industries. So, yes, I, I th- what I'm trying to say is I agree with you completely that it can't just be a college um, focus. There are a lot of really good Americans out there who may never go to college, but have a lot to contribute to this economy. And we need to focus on them as well. So I want to build on the, 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 the governor's observation that we did, um, by a focus on sort of an infrastructure plan, uh, inadvertently put a little too much um, attention on, on D.C. What we do have is that now, um, not telling you anything, Governor, that you don't know, governors are putting together their budgets, legislative sessions in the states are coming in, uh, coming into session after the first of the year. Sort of a last round, uh, round robin, if you had to make one recommendation to either a governor's office or to a state legislature um, to uh, uh, of what they should be doing to, to leverage this moment to solve the digital divide, um, what would you recommend they do? Uh, and uh, Governor, we'll have you, I think we'll let you back clean up since you've got a little, little, little experience in this. You want me to go first or last? I couldn't hear you. Oh, if, if we'll, we'll let you go last. We'll let you have the last word. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'll steal all the ideas of, the, of our esteemed panelists. <laughs> So Evan, let's start with you. So I think it's something Larry hit on earlier, which is the first thing you gotta do is map your problem. You you need to know where you stand today. And that means two things. You need to understand where you have infrastructure today and where you don't. And you need to understand who's connected and who isn't. And for the first time ever, we're seeing industry on both the wired and wireless side step up and participate robustly in those processes. We, we just launched a program called K-12 Bridge to Broadband, where service providers across the country are now helping school districts identify which of their kids do and don't have internet access. And we need to do that for everyone in America. So the first thing you got to do is map. And then the second thing you got to do is find resources anywhere you can and, and leverage the data that you get from those maps to get people connected. Great. Uh, let's go to you, Jonathan. Well, you know, I'd like to focus on the states, as the governor said. I think that, you know, state and federal policy can play a huge role. We need a major investment in uh, closing the digital divide. But as part of that, I think, in addition to supporting wireless infrastructure, we need to support career and technical education that aligns the national standards that we've laid out for the industry, as well as supporting apprenticeships and incumbent worker training for 5G. Uh, So we need state policymakers to recognize this as a priority as part of their education system. I mean, we talk all the time to the people in the states that are responsible for building out uh, the, the wireless network and universal service funds, but we often don't get an opportunity like this to reach the educational 
uh, policymakers and say, hey, put 5G on your list. Because if you don't get the right workforce for that, all the other job growth that you're looking for isn't going to happen. And we have a great model in apprenticeships. Uh, so put that in your uh, priority list as you're setting your budgets for next year and as you're establishing your, your educational plans. Great. Larry, how about you? What would you advise governors and states to do? I've advised a couple of governors and states and um, <laughs> over the last few months, I'm going to give the advice I already gave. Um, I agree with Evan completely. We have to map what we have, what we, what we already have. We need to know what we, what resource we're bringing to the game. But then I think we want, you know, every state and every city is under some type of a balanced budget that the federal government doesn't have. So, the, and they have a lot, billions of fewer dollars than they had in the past. They have to leverage what they have to the maximum extent possible. We have connected public institutions. Let's use those public institutions. The money we have now allows us to bring broadband to the school or to the library, but not outside of that school or library to use for the public. We can do more with those existing facilities. So map what you have and then leverage facilities you have because you're not getting any money unless you're getting it from the feds because you can't raise money in this kind of environment and tax revenues are off. Thanks, Larry. Uh, okay, Governor, what would you would, recommend would, to your own colleagues? I would agree with uh, all three of the, the, the statements. I think leveraging is really the key Governors are pretty good at that, of creating a strategy. Um, I think they need to advance the strategy publicly to draw people towards it, uh, make sure that it is uh, non-partisan, non-political, because it isn't, uh, and embrace philanthropy that is poised to spend literally billions of dollars to help in this if they're given a, a, a proper strategy. I've talked to every major philanthropists that I'm, that I'm aware of that's interested in edu edu the digital divide and education policy, all of them are anxious to help. Uh, corporations are as well. There's the, there's the equity issue, uh, justice issues now going to the forefront of the boards of directors of the major corporations. They can play a constructive role. So to leverage not just the federal monies, but um, philanthropy and private sector monies in a creative way, I think would be really important. Final thing I'd say a, a tangible suggestion would be, and I think it might have been mentioned, is to um, for for school districts that are capable of, you know, when they do their RFPs for telecommunications, to include those that have been left behind that don't have access to a device or don't have access to high speed broadband, to be able to leverage that relationship, which is, you know, Miami Dade County has three hundred and sixty thousand students. Um, and they've done a pretty good job going online with some bumps along the way. But if they could leverage that contract with their telecom providers and, and internet providers, they could provide access in a, in a creative way um, to people that have been left behind. So there's lots of things that could be done. I think it's going to require transparent leadership and uh, people need to be held account uh, to account. And maybe we'll be get, get back to the solutions business again. It'd be kind of fun to watch. Well, thank you all. I, um, I feel like that we have spent about most of the last hour very much in the solutions business. You know, we sort of took a look at, at the digital divide in sort of two big ways, right? We have this big potential for federal funding for traditional notions of, of infrastructure, um, but then also sort of human, like what, what sort of human infrastructure and, and human development do we need? Um, I think we had a, a super actionable set of, of recommendations here at the end for, uh, for, the, for the audience of policymakers and policy wonks that are watching. If I think one, that to really map the problem that came through loud and clear, like where do you stand today? Where do you have infrastructure and where do you not? And who is connected and who isn't? Sometimes in discussions of the digital divide, I think we conflate those things, but they are different. And having those maps would, it would allow us to make, um, make better decisions. Um, and then by the, find the resources anywhere you can to meet those needs. I think, Jonathan, thank you. I think the major investment in CTE and apprenticeships, I think we think of workforce development, but not quite so specifically, I think, as you laid it out here, which is we need workforce development to do the digital divide build out that we're talking about right now. And that, um, that the highway, the, the doing a broadband build out has an ROI like the, like the highway system, but you still gotta have somebody who's going to be able to do that build out to get the similar um, ROI. So to look to uh, states to have a major investment in CTE and apprenticeships to prepare people to work in, uh, in 5G. Um, every state and city has to leverage what they have. Larry reminded us that, um, that there's not going to be a lot of money other than this potential influx of, of federal funds. Um, and how is it that in that mapping, we can leverage 
um, public institutions that are already connected and then and, and get that connectivity wireless out into those communities. Um, and the governor uh, reminded us that um, to advance the strategy, it needs to be nonpartisan, non-political, that we should embrace philanthropy, that they are all anxious to help and that and doing those things. And I think taking the advice of this panel, we have um, the potential for one to tackle this durable problem of, of the digital divide that, that Larry named over 20 years ago and a uh, and a, perhaps a renaissance in, um, in state and local policy making in education um, that would have, that would show sort of an upside to the difficult situation that this pandemic has brought to us in 2020. So thank you all very much for a terrific uh, for a terrific panel. Uh, thank you for the work that you do and for your time here today.